Hi, uh, my name is Sam Quinn. I'm from HRL Laboratories, and today I'll be talking about configuration interaction modeling of silicon resonant exchange qubits for spin photon coupling. So solid state spin qubits are a promising platform for quantum information processing due to their long coherence times, fast operation, scalability, and mature fabrication technology. But one of the disadvantages of these systems is that interactions within them are relatively short range. So in particular, qubits that rely on the exchange interaction must be physically close together. So to overcome this, we would like to couple these systems to cavity mode photons to enable long range qubit entanglement. But this turns out to be kind of a challenge because the magnetic moment of a single electron spin is small. Therefore, we have to couple indirectly to the photon's electric field. And in weak spin orbit materials like silicon, one way to do this is using on-chip micromagnets, which provide magnetic field gradients, yielding spin charge hybridization, and therefore spin photon coupling indirectly. Uh, this has been demonstrated experimentally for a single spin in silicon double quantum dots. See, for example, this paper from Delft or this paper from Jason Petta's group at Princeton. Both papers find characteristic vacuum Rabi mode splitting, uh, which is indicative of strong spin photon coupling. However, the approach that they use with micromagnets will not generalize to multi spin uh, encoded qubits. So, take for example the case of three spins spread across three dots. So, a typical uh, triple quantum dot DFS qubit, which allows all electrical control in contrast to the previously described combination of electric and magnetic control. So recall that the Hilbert space of this system is h-dimensional, where half of these states are, from the perspective of DFS, leaked states with s equals 3 halves. So the issue with magnetic gradients is that they couple the encoded s equals 1 half states with the s equals 3 halves sector, therefore thereby causing leakage. So therefore, we cannot use uh, magnetic gradients to couple a triple quantum dot qubit to a cavity photon. So it turns out that there is another way to do this in the form of the uh, so-called resonant ex exchange, or Rx qubit. So this is an operating regime of a triple quantum dot qubit where hybridization of the one-on-one -on -one occupancy with asymmetric charge states yields a non-zero transverse dipole moment. Um, so it's depicted here as a triangle on this charge stability diagram where the horizontal axis epsilon is what we call the outer detuning. So it's how P1 bias compares to P3 bias. And the vertical axis, uh, this epsilon sub m, is what we refer to as the dimple detuning. So it's how P2 bias compares to the average of P1 and P3 bias. So Rx spin photon coupling has been demonstrated experimentally uh, in 3.5 materials. So see this paper from uh, Zurich in 2018 uh, in gallium arsenide. So here again, you can see that vacuum Rabi mode splitting, which is indicative of strong spin photon coupling. However, silicon has a larger effective mass than gallium arsenide, so it's not obvious that this kind of conventional RX operation will be robust in silicon. So to resolve these questions, we need some kind of a model of a silicon triple quantum dot. And in particular, the quantities we want to model are firstly the exchange energy, um, J, which is defined to be the energy difference between these two different S equals one half states, which basically differ in whether the first two electrons form a singlet or a triplet. And we're going to assume that there is a gate referred J noise with one over F character. And we're going to parameterize the amplitude of that noise in terms of basically the derivatives of J with respect to each gate voltage. Um, and lastly, we want to know the magnitude of the spin uh, photon coupling rate G, which depends uh, both on the resonator impedance Z as well as the resonator gate's lever arm operator, um, denoted alpha here, which is an operator that basically indicates a gate's degree of influence in, on the chemical potential in the quantum well uh, underneath the gate. So in this figure, I have plotted alpha as a function of position for this upper right gate, um, which is the resonator gate in this geometry. Um, the thing that I want to emphasize here is that computing this matrix element accurately in general requires detailed knowledge of the microscopic wave functions. Um, but first, let's look at a simple model in the form of this Fermi Hubbard Hamiltonian expressed here in a six state basis. So, detuning in the chemical potentials mu leads to hybridization with doubly occupied states, since these states couple to the encoded 111 states through these tunnel couplings T T12 and T23. There is also an energy penalty, U sub C, for doubly occupying a dot. And we can sweep over these uh, Fermi Hubbard parameters to produce plots like the one on the right in this slide. So we refer to such a plot as a fingerprint plot. It's basically a plot of the cosine of J times T for some fixed uh, time T. So in this case, T is one nanosecond. So each bright fringe here is an integer multiple of uh, one gigahertz exchange. And we find by inspecting this plot that Fermi Hubbard predicts the existence of this 
so-called asymmetric resonant exchange or ARX regime at uh, relatively low dimple detuning, uh, which persists to multi-gigahertz J as we uh, forward bias our X gates. However, the electrostatics that are being used here are quite suspect. Um, in particular, the cross capacitance is being modeled only with a simple heuristic. Um, so basically, what we want to know is you know, how accurate is this and how does Fermi Hubbard stack up against more sophisticated microscopic modeling. So to assess the generalizability of Fermi Hubbard, um, we really want to incorporate realistic device electrostatics and treat this full multi-particle Hamiltonian. So we want to solve the full three Poisson equation and then basically use techniques from quantum chemistry to approximate the microscopic eigenstates. And the technique that we use to do this is called configuration interaction, or CI, which involves expanding the unknown eigenstates in a basis of Slater determinants, which are constructed from an underlying single particle basis set. And in general, due to the variational principle, there is a trade-off here between accuracy and CPU time and memory. Um, however, the three electron system fortunately is small enough that what's called full configuration interaction, or FCI, is feasible, in which a complete set of Slater determinants is used without truncation. Now, you'll often hear of FCI being referred to as an exact solution. That's not really true. The accuracy of FCI does depend on the span of the underlying single particle basis set, as well as the mesh discretization in this case, so-called discretization error. Um, note also that we're using an effective mass Hamiltonian, and the lattice is not necessarily being modeled atomistically here. Um, we're also ignoring the Silicon Valley degree of freedom. We're going to ignore magnetic fields, and we're going to ignore spin orbit effects. So despite this uh, laundry list of compromises, um, FCI still captures way more of the physics than Fermi Hubbard. And a good way to see that is through a direct comparison between the two. So that's what's depicted on this slide, um, with Fermi Hubbard on the left and FCI on the right. So remember that I said that Fermi Hubbard predicts uh, that this ARX regime persists to arbitrarily high exchange. Uh, but that doesn't really pan out when we go to FCI. So instead, FCI predicts that ARX tops out at around a gigahertz of exchange, um, and moreover, that this state is isolated in bias space. So it's actually this little dot here on this slide, if you can see that. Um, so this state would likely be difficult to access experimentally as the voltage window is quite narrow. And in general, at higher X gate bias, we see that Fermi Hubbard sort of breaks down compared to FCI. Um, or at least that it's incapable of modeling exchange as the electrons tend to reposition themselves underneath the barrier gates. Um, and in this, re in this regime, we see the formation of an unexpected seam of fast exchange circled here in red, which we refer to as XRX. And uh, this is what it looks like. So on this slide, we have slices of the FCI potentials and densities lo for lo several locations on the RX fingerprint from the previous slide. In particular, I have DFS idle labeled state one here. I have ARX uh, labeled state two, and I have XRX labeled state three, which is this density on the right. And in particular, if we, if we look at this density, which we can do easily with FCI in contrast to simpler models, we see that XRX occurs in a sort of inverted double quantum dot located underneath the barrier gates. Um, this is a significantly different charge configuration compared to DFS. Um, it's more akin to a hybrid qubit, say, uh, except at zero detuning. Um, but remember that this state is still adiabatically connected to DFS, so it's possible to go from here to here, from state 1 to state 3 in this case, without losing quantum information along the way. And in addition to high exchange, XRX supports a fast spin photon coupling rate, G, on the order of 10 megahertz, uh, assuming a typical resonator impedance of around 50 ohms. Um, and it also possesses substantial resilience against charge noise, as evidenced by this narrow sweet spot here in J noise amplitude. And when we take the ratio of these two quantities, we find that the result can exceed uh, 10 along the center of this XRX seam, meaning that XRX may actually be a good candidate for real-world spin photon coupling. Um, in fact, simulations suggest that XRX may be able to achieve good fidelities following a cavity eye swap protocol, assuming a reasonably good cavity quality factor. Here on the left plot, we show the Bell state fidelity following such a protocol as a function of the ratio of G to the variance of J fluctuations, which is related to the J noise amplitude. As you can see, fidelities uh, in excess of 99% are possible for low cavity loss and large coupling to noise ratios similar to those attainable in the XRX regime. However, remember that a real-world implementation of this protocol will require actually biasing between DFS and XRX. And there is a non-trivial optimization problem here because you cannot bias too slowly uh, or else you open yourself up to charge noise along the path, but you can't bias too quickly either, or else you might populate excited states non-adiabatically. Um, also note that everything up until now has ignored uh, the Silicon Valley degree of freedom, so it's possible that valley physics may affect the experimental realization of XRX. Um, so to conclude, I hope I've convinced you that Fermi Hubbard is inadequate to fully describe RX operation. Uh, more accurate modeling in the form of FCI points to the existence of this unexpected XRX state, 
which may be a good candidate for real real world uh, spin photon coupling due to its uh, larger voltage window compared to ARX, higher exchange, large dipole moment, as well as uh, high state symmetry, which protects against charge noise. And lastly, further research is needed to determine the viability of XRX in the face of alloy disorder and time-dependent unitary evolution in real silicon devices. So for more details on this, see our paper entitled Resonant Exchange Operation in Triple Quantum Dot Qubits for Spin Photon uh, Transduction, published in Quantum Science and Technology. Um, so that's it. Thanks for listening. And uh, lastly, if you're interested in working with us in sunny Malibu, California, um, please reach out if interested, or you can check quantum.hrl.com for recent job postings. Thank you.